Hello, Professor uh, Jarofsky. It's such a pleasure to uh, have this interview with you uh, for JCAX. And um, thank you for accepting the invitation for um, the interview for the Journal of the Canadian Association for Curriculum Studies, La Revue de l'Association Canadienne pour l'étude du curriculum. Uh, Professor Jurovsky, you work at the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy in UBC, and your teaching and scholarship focus on the intersection of curriculum, embodied mathematics, and new pedagogies. The entry point I chose to begin the interview today is your work on embodied mathematics and how it can inform mathematics curriculum in general and teaching practices in particular. Can you tell us a bit um, about what um, embodied mathematics is, why we need it in the mathematics curriculum for our students, and how can we incorporate it into our pedagogies and instructional approaches? Hmm, that's a big question. But lovely to be here, Osnath, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, so maybe I'll start by saying about something about um, less embodied mathematics, which is what people are mostly used to from their school mathematics experiences. Um, in the 100-year-old maybe traditions or maybe 150-year-old traditions of uh, public schooling, mathematics uh, is often done as something that's done, uh, it's very solitary. Students are very static when they are doing it. They are um, listening passively a lot of the time to a teacher talking and explaining. And in many ways, the teacher is the one that's doing the math in the room. The students are not necessarily doing an awful lot of mathematical thinking or understanding. Um, so we're, we're all very used to that kind of, you know, I, I, I hesitate to call it traditional, but say the typical school mathematics where students are in individual desks in rows, um, all facing the teacher. They're copying notes that the teacher is writing somewhere, and um, they're asked some factual questions and just to kind of keep the teacher's monologue going, more or less. And then they are asked to do some exercises from a textbook, and they're, later they're tested and quizzed. So this is, this is what everyone is used to. And I'm not saying that this is entirely bad either. I think there, there are places where um, there are things that teachers need to just come out and say, rather than expecting everyone to guess what's on their mind or um, in Dave Hewitt's words, to, to be able to somehow derive something that's arbitrary rather than logically necessary, right? But there are many things in mathematics that, um, that people can work out for themselves and can ask their own questions and can explore and um, work in a mathematical way to um, to appreciate it and be interested in, in the patterns of this world, which to me is what mathematics is all about. So uh, uh, rather than making everyone be static and silent, moving only their fingers and their eyes at their desk, why could we not use the um, abilities that we all bring with us all the time to move our bodies, to use all our senses rather than just seeing and passively listening? to collaborate with other people and with the materials and the things in our environment. And to uh, through that, to begin to uh, understand the patterns of patterns that are in our world and to be able to notate them and work with them, manipulate them and see how a certain pattern might arise in more than one place, for example. So to me, this is, this is really what mathematics learning is about. There's a kind of wonderment about the world and um, a sensory sensual appreciation of um, of the beauty of the world that, that is part of mathematics. And there's also uh, a kind of generalization or abstraction when you can think about a pattern and maybe draw or diagram it, um, gesture it, um, be able to give a name to something and, uh, and work with it somehow, um, see how that entity con connects with other entities or not. Um, so these are all things that people can do through um, physical embodied work and you can do it outside as well as inside. So I'm, I'm very much a proponent of doing mathematics outdoors in a more natural place, whether it's a school garden or a beach or a forest or a park uh, or just on the school playground, but to 
have a place where you're where it's big enough for it to move and actually move and locomote and um to be amongst other living beings like plants and animals and birds and the soil and the wind and the air but to and to um and to notice patterning that happens uh, all around us all the time rather than a place that's pretty much square and straight lines and human made and fairly bleak as many mathematics classrooms are. I hear lots of um, inspiring um, I I ideas here. Um, um, the the map the um, definition of mathematics first. I mean, there is lots of discourse about what is mathematics and what do we really mean when we want our students or children to do mathematics. And so this, uh, when you framed it as working on the patterns or finding or identifying or making sense of the pattern of patterns, I think that's a beautiful way of, of getting away from this operational paradigm uh, that that is more the focus of in, in math uh, in school curriculum uh, where students again we don't like the word traditionally but uh, this is how math is perceived by let's say parents and we're not talking about teachers here right i mean teachers are uh, receiving the um uh, uh the new pedagogies so depending on the learning theories they they uh, work within so they at least have the background knowledge of, of uh, or the pedagogical knowledge uh, that is expected to make the shift the necessary shift but let's talk about parents i think parents uh, many parents don't, still don't um, uh, many parents require this new understanding of what, what mathematics is and perhaps with that understanding they there will be uh, less resistance uh, with you know efforts uh, such as in Alberta, uh, parents um, really having lots of resistance uh, with regards to uh, this uh, new kind of making new way, not new kind, not, not not new kind, but new way of making sense of mathematics. So working on the pattern of patterns um, and and gesturing a diagram. Uh, doing mathematics outdoors. These are um, not new ideas, but I think uh, we need to uh, perhaps educate parents in order to have their power and support in this in, in um, making this uh, shift. Um, thank you so much uh, for for this response. Um, when you talked about uh, doing, can I jump in here too? For I, I want to just comment on what you're saying that. I really want to be very careful not to dichotomize anything. I'm really wary of binaries. And so the um, uh, so I want to say that I'm not against doing mathematical operations and learning how they work. I'm not against sometimes sitting down at a table and writing things on a piece of paper. And I'm not against a teacher sometimes explaining something, you know, even doing a, a mini lecture of some kind. Uh, I think that's part of what math is, but it's not all of what math is. And so what I what I really see is as the, so, there, I, so I've sometimes seen people who are not fond of math and I'm you know, they could be students, teachers, parents, administrators or anybody, people who are not who are somewhat, you know, um, leery of mathematics and, and not happy with it, say they've said to me things like, Oh, all we have to do is get the kids to just kind of wiggle around, jump around on the playground, and then we'll say we've done math. I go, no. And others who say, oh, what's this foolishness? It's only all right for the very small children in preschool to move. But as you get more serious, you just sit very still and just cogitate, just ideas flow from your head, you know, uh, like, you know, Athena rising from Zeus's forehead, that sort of thing. And there's, um, and there's no... Uh, you know, it, it, it's undignified and uh, unseemly and unsophisticated to actually move. And I say no to that as well. Yeah. Uh, what I really what I can see as valuable is a kind of oscillation between um, some kind of uh, work that is exploring a pattern with our bodies, with our hearing, with our touch and sense of smell, maybe at a very large scale even, so that we're we're completely involved in it and then sitting down and talking and writing and drawing and doing operations and then we have another question that arises from that so we go back and test it in physically outdoors with materials 
and then we write some more. So I, I just see a back and forth of these two. I don't think one is wrong and the other is right, but um, I think they're that each one that the experiences um, let people have a a, a visceral and um, and and really internalized kind of sense of how the relationships work, and the writing and operations how people then. Um, kind of hold it in their hand and be able to manipulate it and feel they have some mastery over it. And then uh, new questions will arise. So that's what I really see. And, um, and in my experience, parents are very convinced when, they're, when their kids can explain to them something really interesting. Um, and I, I've, I've had this happen many times when I was a high school teacher, you know, back some years ago. And I would give kids... Um, math projects in the math class and they would take home uh, these explorations where I there was no um, there was no right answer I didn't have an answer but they had to figure out um, um, for example we did a, a project pretty typical topic about Islamic tilings from the Alhambra and uh, tessellations of the plane but there were there was a lot that kids derived for themselves and that I had never seen before sometimes uh, like for example folding and cutting a, a tiling pattern like a like a paper snowflake that we make in school all the time. And there would be wonderful surprises for me as well as for the kids. And um, parents would come into parent night and they'd say, I've never seen my son or daughter so interested and just working on this night after night. And then they'd show me and explain what they were doing with the compass and straight edge. And, and I was I was really impressed by what they were doing and their, their reasoning about it. And say, yes, that's what it is. That's, that's what it is to, to do something that you care about and that you, um, where you were actually trying to figure something out and you stick to it because you're interested. Absolutely. I, I hear with, with uh, what you're saying, res reference to perseverance, uh, engagement, and these, these are two uh, of, of quite a few uh, qualifiers that we uh, many times don't find in math classrooms. So uh, I, I wonder um, how we can um, uh, push this work in terms of uh, surfacing the mathematical concepts that people, that students do use when they uh, cut and fold and, and create uh, snowflakes. Um, I, I've uh, read uh, recently about the mathematics that is involved uh, with uh, three-year-olds um, where when when they try to get hold of an object, which is, let's say, on the shelf. And so the researcher there describes how the child's decision to, uh, you know, the plan of, of the uh, trajectory or, you know, going straight, um, getting over, uh, going over, stepping over a, an object that is, um, uh, you know, in the middle of uh, the way, uh, moving objects. They, they, this is also um, mathematics, but uh, you know we have the line, the, the, the conception of a line here. We have the uh, conception of measurement, uh, a, you know, estimating measurement, the, the the distance, how many steps you'll have to take to get to this object. This is also mathematics, and I agree with you. Uh, we do need uh, to allow students to engage with some level of automatization of operations, right? I mean, we do need to know uh, um, a few, uh, lots of facts in mathematics, but uh, what I meant to say is that uh, when the operations take 99.9% .9 of school curriculum, that's where the problem begins. And, and uh, just, uh, um, fascinating uh, understanding that embodied mathematics, where we move around uh, outside and make sense of the patterns of patterns, uh, as you say it, is is absolutely um, a, a, you know a, a amazing an amazing opportunity for students to engage with a different sort of mathematics. Um, let me. Um, I'm going to jump in again. <laughs> Sorry to give yeah, you sure. a but, but there's a there's another sense about persistence and and being able to stay with something. And that's the sense of pleasure and enjoyment uh, and aesthetic appreciation of what you're doing. So if you're doing something that's grim and um, that you feel kind of disgusted by or you don't, you don't enjoy and it just seems like um, punishment, of course you don't want to persist with it. It's, there's nothing there for you, except maybe someone else patting you on the head afterwards and saying you did a good job. But if there's something intrinsically beautiful about what you're 
um, what you're experiencing and working with, it's a completely different story. So, and beauty can be anything from, I mean, like looking at a beautiful branch of a tree or a flower or plant, but it could also be working with a really beautiful um, human made object. Like um, we were doing something um, with um, using a tug of war, a slow motion tug of war to represent um, um, absolute value moving from in either direction from a, a central point. Wow. And um, uh, I was working with Dr. Catherine Ricketts, who's at the University of Regina, and she, she, she has a real, she's a dancer as well. She has a sense of, of the aesthetic in a lovely way. So she said, get one of those really beautiful um, plum bobs. It's a, like a, a piece of, of brass that's meant to hang from a surveyor's instrument, very old fashioned, and um, it will hang straight down. She said, let's get one of those really beautiful, pleasing things. And so doing this tug of war with this beautiful object kind of hanging on the string was very nice, you know? And I think, you know, we want to find, like, if we can, and it, similarly, if we're using sound to represent mathematics, let's make it a really beautiful sound, a musical sound, a beautiful vocal sound. Let's work with the poetry, like actually structuring poetry mathematically and find words that, that mean something to us. I mean, just, just using, using materials, whether they're physical materials or more abstract materials, but that are, that are really, um, that we find intriguing and beautiful and we're compelled to figure things out about them. That's wonderful. And if it's, if it's not aesthetically pleasing, I mean, even chalk on a board, I mean, I love chalkboards and you know, using different colored chalks and stuff or on, on, on a sidewalk and using sidewalk chalk, there's something that can be very, very aesthetic about that. And so, you know, this should not be a grim, um, you know, like kind of like this is, get it down, you will, it will, you know, give you your vitamins or something like that. But it should be something that actually tastes delicious and feels very nice and sounds wonderful and has a nice scent and, you know, whatever else, just like things that are, that are really, um, you know, part of the beauty of the world. I, I think you uh, identified exactly what we need to bring back into, uh, not that it was never there before, but I think perhaps it was hidden. It was pushed into the shadows, the joy of doing math and the beauty that is hidden there, but is um, covered by layers and layers of, of, uh, of uh, ways we have been doing uh, math in schools. Um, I, I would like to go to the next question. Um, in your work, a conversation on embodiment at the heart of abstraction in mathematics education and music education that you co-authored with Scott Goebel and published in JCAX, you point out that the Platonist approach to mathematics education is counterproductive to what mathematics education should, and I would add can, be about. Can you elaborate on this idea of a Platonist um, uh, approach and what should be an alternative approach and what might be some of the changes you would like to see in the mathematics curriculum across grade levels? Well, the Platonist approach is very much about um, that this world is not enough, this world is not good enough, and the, that the world that we seek is a world of um, perfect forms of abstract um, perfection in a way. And I think it, it seems to me that this way of thinking arises from um, fear of mortality, fear of death, fear of dirt and decay and um, all the, the things that are um, not crystalline and sort of perfect, so-called perfect in this life. And looking for things that will, like, for some kind of realm where there'll be eternal truths and eternal objects that will not um, degrade or decay in any way. So I do understand that wish, but I don't hold with that as a way of, of life because it's always, everything is uh, deferred to some um, kind of heaven that is supposed to exist in the afterlife or in parallel to the world that we know. Uh, but I think there's, there's infinity and an eternity of a sort that we can experience in this life, even though we are mortal. And that we, um, and so the, the uh, platonic world is talking about um, sort of uh, a little bit like in Euclidean geometry where we talk about straight lines that have no width and that go on infinitely 
long in both directions or uh, circles that are perfect circles, not like the one you would draw with sidewalk chalk on the pavement, or even like when you could draw on a computer, no matter how magnified you could make it, it's still slightly pixelated, you know, but it's just sort of saying this idea of the, of the circle. So, I mean, my way of thinking about this is that the, the idea of a circle came from people's experiences of the world. So it might come from like rotating your wrist around, or it might come from noticing the shape of your eyeball or your mouth when you go, ooh, uh, or holding hands with a bunch of people and pulling back as far as you can and you create a circle or spinning. So all, there's all these different ways of circling, of, cir of circle being uh, uh, an action or something that you experience very intimately in yourself. And from that, we could say, well, if we took sort of the main, the, the most salient features of the circle, it might be like points that are all equidistant from a center, like when we all hold hands and pull back from a center point, or it could be what happens when you spin something, like when we, as little kids, we spin around and fall to the ground and the world seems to be circling around us. And so we, it, we're, we're sort of taking a generalization or an abstraction from something that we actually experience over and over again in, in, in our lives. And that to me is what, where these mathematical ideas come from. They come from our experiences and observations of, of life. Uh, they don't originate in some, you know, ethereal plane uh, like the platonic world and sort of exist in isolation from us. But they're, they're coming from our many, many experiences of, of our life within our bodies and in our places. Yeah. So I would would you say that uh, John Dewey's idea of experience um, experiences learning through experience would would uh, be relevant here because he be essentially says um, back in the nineteen sixties he said um, we need to have students experiencing um, the the um, learning process rather than being told what to um, know to experience and through experience the knowledge uh, uh, of, of conce concepts and the relationship between concepts will, uh, will uh, I shouldn't say emerge, but uh, developed. So would you think um, that uh, John Dewey's uh, experiences, experiences paradigm be a good alternative here? Well, uh, yeah, I think the Dewey idea and even you could go back to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and others who have um, campaign for experiential learning. But I, I don't think, but I think that, you know, when it, as, as teachers or educators, we're also involved in initiating new generations into a culture or maybe many cultures. And um, so there's, there's some, I wouldn't assume that the, you know, just get people to do a certain experience and everything will just arise, emerge without any uh, talk or any um, guidance of any kind. I, I think that, that something will emerge, but it, it may not be what you're thinking of. <laughs> and I, so I, I think that there's, there's some level of sharing the things that we love and sharing the things that are part of our culture that we think are treasures of our cultures and that are valuable for new generations to know that shouldn't be forgotten. Um, and some of that is done through talk and through reading and through discussion and and then there are, but there are also experiences like without the, again, I, I don't want to, to make a binary that it must all be experience or it must all be talk, but that there's a, um, there's a sort of sweet spot where uh, some combination of experience and, and talk and the teachers being learners as well. So that things that there'll be things that the students discover or happen across or think about that maybe we as teachers haven't thought about yet. Which ties with uh, uh, something you said before, um, with regards to uh, conversations and discussions and collaboration and projects, and so that opens space for students and teachers too to uh, take ownership over mathematical ideas rather than being dictated um, with regards to mathematical content, which is sometimes understandable um, and learned. Uh, we can 
uh, have a whole discussion about what learning is and how it looks like. But uh, what but what I mean to say is co through collaboration, students have um, an opportunity to take ownership over mathematical ideas. But again, collaboration in itself has a whole, you know, um, a understanding of what it means and what how it looks like, right? Because w when we organize students into groups, it doesn't necessarily mean that each and every student does go through a meaningful learning through reasoning and learning and, and sense making, right? Uh, so so lots of talk about that uh, I, as well. Um, um, I would like to uh, go to the next question. Um, you, your personal experience, um, I also I always wonder about the personal experiences of, of scholars, what brought them to this space of making sense of, of uh, in our context, mathematical uh, ideas and curriculum um, through, you know, in, in a new in new ways. So what would be, uh, can you tell us about uh, your personal experience and how it shaped your understanding of curriculum and math education? Well, I, I have to start with a, a wonderful teacher that I had <laughs> in high school. His name was Bob, Bob McVean, and he was the department head at my school in Hamilton, Ontario at that time. And um, he, I, I had always um, found math and logic very, um, came intuitively to me. It was easy and, and fun in a way, but I didn't really see much meaning to it. So even though math was my um, top subject in terms of marks and so on, I did math contests and, but I, I, I didn't really love it until I had this wonderful teacher who, who brought um, you know, together math together with other disciplines. So we did math projects. We did things about math and literature, math and games, math history, um, uh, math and art. And through that, I, I began to really love mathematics. And I could see that there were other students like me. I mean, there was always a link between math and science. And I, I also like science, but it was not my main area. I've always been uh, very involved with the arts, so um, music, poetry, theater, film, mostly sort of performing arts like that. Uh, and um, so to be able to connect the patterns of mathematics with those those kinds of things was, was super exciting for me. And with philosophy even sort of, you know, as a teenager, everyone is thinking about, you know, what is life all about? And as they begin to kind of take first steps to being independent adults. Um, and so I guess, and I guess part of my experience is that I, I find it very hard just to sit still and be completely blank faced. And <laughs> I'm not that kind of person who can do that for very long. Um, in my doctoral program, one of my colleagues, uh, Celeste Snober and I were both kind of um, wiggly doctoral students who needed to move. And <laughs> Celeste's background is as a dancer and, and poet. And uh, she challenged me. We, we were doing a directed studies course together that ended up being about embodiment from a lot of different points of view. And she had like really no um, particular interest in math or special background in math. So I would come at things from a mathematical education point of view, and she would come at it through spirituality and dance and her areas of, of work. Um, so we ended up doing um, an anti-infinity dance together called Beyond the Span of My Limbs that we published some stuff about way back then. And um, and Celeste also said to me, uh, well, take dance classes. Like you're, you know, as a doctoral student, you can take anything you like. You don't have to pay anything extra. There's this wonderful uh, dance program, like take some dance classes. So I did a lot of modern dance classes and classes in West African traditional dance and all kinds of stuff like that. And um, through being engaged in that movement, and I mean, have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I was not a star dancer in any of my classes by any <laughs> means, but I really enjoyed the experience. So I suggest that others try the same, get involved in, in the arts and ways that nourish you and, and challenge you. And, um, and there were many things I learned by that embodied experience, like the very intense embodied experience of doing modern dance um, that also fed into the math work I was doing. And I, um, when I became a, a prof at UBC, I almost immediately was contacted by someone from, um, uh, from the Bridges Math and Art Organization. They were about to do a, 
uh, symposium at the Banff International Research Station. And they were looking for Canadian academics who were involved in math and the arts. And I'm not quite sure how word got out that, you know, this is what I've been doing with my high school classes and in my scholarship. But anyway, somehow somebody knew. And, um, and that also, I mean, having being kind of with, with my people, with pe other people who, who were working quite intensely on mathematics, the combination of mathematics and the arts was, has been, I mean, not only was, but continues to be a really wonderful stimulus for new uh, cl collaborations, new um, interdisciplinary kinds of work, and also creating things like plays and movies and poetry and music and all that kind of stuff. So amazing. It's, it's fascinating to know that there's so much more to do with regards to the combination of math and arts and uh, dancing and uh, um, looking outside and making sense of everything mathematically. That's amazing. Thank you sh uh, for sharing. Um, uh, my next question is, um, what are some local and contextual limitations and possibilities that constrain or enable your work as a scholar in curriculum and, and, and um, math education? And how are these compared to those of other locations? Um, so basically, um, uh, can you talk about your experiences in different contexts in terms of, uh, of uh, the limitations and possibilities of change? Hmm. Well, I, I guess I've never been a person who really respected the boundaries in a very serious way. I know I you know, respect the boundaries, but but boundaries between different um, between different disciplines, for example, I think of them as convenient fictions, but not really. And you know, it is helpful to have disciplines because they develop, you know, within a certain kind of um, paradigm. But uh, uh, but I've always found myself working in interdisciplines of some kind. So um, my background as I was before I started doing math education was in languages and linguistics and um, and uh, so at first I started out working in like the language of math education which led me to an interdiscipline called genre theory so genres is somehow it's not a discipline in itself but there are people who come from um, from linguistics from literature studies from film from music from education and many other areas um, who the, this concept of a genre and the development of the idea of genre is really important. And then also as I was working with um, language and embodiment, uh, I got involved with gesture studies. And I was amazed to find <laughs> that there's an international society for gesture studies that has a conference every couple of years. And um, and again, it's, an, it's a sort of interdiscipline because there it was... Uh, particularly of interest to uh, linguists who are working with um, deaf sign languages, but also to musicians who are interested in um, conducting, like conducting an orchestra, um, to um, people in art history who looked at sort of the frozen gestures of a sculpture or a painting from the past, uh, to intercultural studies, people thinking of the gestures in different cultures, and to um, people in, in AI and IT who were trying to get, say, on-screen avatars to gesture in a naturalistic way. And then math educators. There's a whole bunch of us who work in this area of gesture. Uh, so so I've, I've often found myself in these in-between places. And right now, uh, it's lots and lots of stuff about math and art. Um, there's a whole international group of us that meet every month now on Zoom to, uh, it's the uh, Dance Movement and Mathematics group. And it's a, it's a wonderful group who are doing work in education and in dance performance. Uh, and it's, again, it's great to meet your peeps in a way to meet the people who, other people who are interested in this work. And we push each other in different ways. For sure. Is it open to um, like uh, graduate students or only established scholars? Graduate students as well. So if anyone, is interested in joining up, get in touch with me. We, there's about, probably about 24 people now who are involved, but not everyone shows up every month. So worldwide. Usually, yeah, worldwide. Yeah, really wow. from all over the place. So amazing. So and, and those who are interested in joining don't necessarily have to have mathematics, um, backgrounds in mathematics. They, they can be um, anyone or um, specifically graduate students in math or math education. 
it's like it's it's not a huge group it's a little discussion group so you should have some interest at least in dance movement and mathematics and how they intersect but if you do get in touch and you can come join <laughs> absolutely so we, there you go you have an inv open invitation here um so if if parents um uh, are watching us now, uh, what would you be some ideas for parents to support and surface the use of mathematics based on, on embodied mathematics? Well, I want to tell you about a project that um, I'm working on right now to answer this question in a bit of a roundabout way. So one thing that, that really um, has struck me in recent years and, and many other math education and, uh, researchers as well, is that what happens in the school is only part of the culture around mathematics in a society. And um, I would venture to say that in Canada and maybe even in the English speaking world or maybe beyond the English speaking world, there are a lot of people who have had bad experiences with math and who then are afraid of math and are not um, reticent to say so and to say that they hate math, they can't do math. Um, and I was thinking about you know, what if there's a kid who has a really good experience in their school math class and they come home and they say they are enthusiastic about it with their family. And then their uncle says, oh, but I was never good at math. Oh, no. And their next door neighbor goes, no, nobody around here is good at math. And oh, no. their dad says, you know, uh, you know, you'll never be good at math. And, you know, the cousin says, no, I was, you know, I discourage you from math. So then it, it puts a damper on the, the whole idea. And, the, and there's a lot of that kind of talk that goes around. So I thought, I wonder how we can, how we can interrupt that cycle of these negative experiences leading to more negative experiences. And I, I thought about working with a whole community. And when I say community, I don't mean like the sort of the classroom community is how people frame it often, which just means the kids and the teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about an actual community, intergenerational people of all ages. And, um, and to, um, you know, there's a saying, uh, you know, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. And I, I sort of want to be able to offer some experiences and some, um, and it, over several years with the whole community where people can have a happy childhood in terms of their engagement with mathematics in embodied, artistic, um, aesthetically pleasing, intriguing and fascinating ways. Uh, and then to sort of see how their stories of math may get changed. It's about restoring math. You know, seeing if we can come have new stories about math that are different from those classroom ones about not being able to remember your times table or not remembering how to add fractions or something like that. Right? So uh, so we're in year one of a five-year uh, project right now. Uh, my colleague Cynthia Nichol at UBC is involved as well. And we're working with a community that I'm um, peripherally part of. It's a uh, um, one of the Gulf Islands um, in BC, Hornby Island. And um, we've been a part-time residents there for quite a long time, for decades already. And I know lots of people on the island. And I know that it's an island of artists. Practically everybody is doing art of some kind. And it's also a place where there are both mathematical artists and um, like Sarah Chase, for example, the modern dancer who does number theory dances and Tom Knott, who's a physicist who makes topological metal sculptures. But there's also a lot of um, this kind of, what you see everywhere is this kind of negative formulation about math. So, uh, so we work to, to put together a partnership with a lot of different groups in the community um, and to do this intergenerational um, math art engagement. And um, our, in year one, the year we're in right now, um, we were looking for our, our first topic because I want to do different kinds of arts, like maybe one year we'll do fiber arts, and another year we'll do dance, another year we'll do poetry and, you know, different things. But in the first year, the arising from the community came this wish to do something about labyrinths. Labyrinths. Now, I didn't know nothing, knew nothing about, um, about the mathematics of labyrinths, but I did happen to know three people, two, three friends who are labyrinth designers. Now I'm on the West Coast, right? So that's, that's what it's like around here. It's They're true. amazing people with amazing, amazing backgrounds. So I talked to my friends. They put me on to some uh, reading. And then we started to do mathematical labyrinth workshops. And each time we do a workshop, I learn a lot of really new, interesting things about the mathematics of labyrinths. 
And there, it turns out there are many ways that you can use the idea of variance, invariance, looking for impossibility proofs, um, looking for which kind of patterns are generated in what way and which ones work as labyrinths and which ones don't. But also in the, in the exploration of it, you can also make labyrinths. Um, like we just made some beautiful labyrinths on the beach, on these big sandy beaches that are on the island. Uh, with people from, I guess the youngest was six years old and the oldest was 91 this time. We've also worked with the daycare where the youngest was two and a half years old. Amazing. <laughs> and we've also worked with the, they started having the seniors lunches again and we had people who were well into their 90s in, in that group. So we, and you know, kids from the school, parents and kids together, just middle-aged people, like just every age group. And um, what, what I find really exciting about that is that it's not sort of, people trying to do something with just the kids and everyone else goes like, I'm not learning anything anymore. I've had it. I don't do math, but you can do it. You know, it's all right for you. Oh, yeah. uh, and you're like, no, I, I don't want to do things like that anymore. I think we need to get everybody involved. And there's um, this, these kind of um, explorations are quite accessible to everyone. And I have some knowledge that I'm sharing that I've learned from others. Uh, through books and through, you know, previous workshops and so on. And then I'm surprised sometimes by the things that that people are coming up with. I'm very frequently surprised. And I, I sort of knew one little corner of how labyrinths work, but now I'm learning more. And so, uh, and there's design involved too, because we're going to make some permanent labyrinths on the island. So, um, uh, so every time it's kind of like you you set down a stone and you step on it and you step down another stone and you step on it, but you do that together. So that there's um, there's a a shared learning and also a kind of a buzz around the place where people are talking about labyrinths and sketching them on the back of a notebook and you know and it becomes a thing that people are engaged with all the time. So that's, that's my awesome. answer, yeah. And I it's like I don't want to tell parents to do something with your the kids. I, I like that you will give them a workbook to do. No, or, do it together. Yeah, do it together, but do it in do a way. Yeah, like that. You need to be intrigued by it too, and be aware that your six-year-old might actually come across something that you didn't understand before, and they might explain it to you, and vice versa. Exactly. Let them let let kids um, uh, ask the questions, and don't. I, I mean, this is my motto: don't uh, pretend to know the answers, but collaboratively. Uh, work on on exploring and finding you know a solution, not the answer. Uh, uh, one of many many possible solutions. That's that's the beauty of of the process. This is so fascinating. Uh, I'm I'm curious. So, how would you scale up this kind of a project? I mean, it, it sounds like a fascinating way to to tie uh, between math and and uh, disciplines that where you know math uh, was hidden. Right, I mean, in music and and um, uh, and um, shapes, uh, as you described. Um, so, how can that kind of work be scaled up so that many more communities can be involved in uh, mutual collaboration? Well, it seems to me that this this could be done, and this is a a community with around twelve hundred people um, who are there year round. Um, but it could be done with lots of other small communities, but also within a, an urban space, like say if you're in a large city, but there's a, a neighborhood that's centered around a school, a neighborhood house, um, you know, community center or art center. It could be happening in that community. And it doesn't have to be the same thing. For example, this idea of labyrinths was very meaningful to this particular community, but some other place it might be something else. Um, and it, it might be more arts based or more engineering based or language based. I mean, there are all kinds of different sorts of preoccupations that different communities have, but I think it has to be something you're preoccupied with that you really care about as a group that, that is uh, meaningful to the group. Um, and yeah, I, and, then it's have, and animators like to have people who will, who will, you know, in, in French, we talk about uh, animateur like somebody who's a kind of catalyst or a, takes a guiding role, but doesn't necessarily um, leads. They lead, but they don't. They don't necessarily 
um, do everything. Yeah. They, they get people energized in some way. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, um, with, with COVID-19, um, where everything was shut down, um, how did you um, work on this uh, community-based uh, exploration? Well, there, there was some time where I couldn't even go to the island, even though we have a house there, um, because we were restricted in even provincial tr travel, you know, out of our health uh, authority zone. So uh, during that time, it was, I did workshops here in Vancouver with teachers and with my students and so on. So we still pushed the idea forward, uh, you know, took little films and photographs and documented what we were doing and then communicated with people on the island through uh, Zoom, like the, through our partner organizations on the island. Um, but as soon as we were able to actually be there, um, we could start doing things outdoors. So for example, on the beach, not a problem because it's windy and people are, you know, a bit spaced apart from each other and it's not an issue. Uh, we did do some workshops in November indoors, but you know, Everyone had to have their vaccination passport and be masked at that at that time. Um, there's, I mean, they during COVID they built a kind of a cylindrical tent sort of structure over part of the school playground that gave us sort of an indoor outdoor kind of space. Again, it was windy, but you were protected from the rain, and mm -hmm. so we could work in in spaces like that or a big picnic shelter by the beach. You know, so. Um, just like the, uh, I mean, the bands and the, the dance group I'm in right now, we've been meeting outdoors all through the winter. And we found we were much more hardy than we realized. And we could play instruments even at like one degree Celsius and our fingers wouldn't quite freeze. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading uh, more about this uh, fascinating work. I, I'm personally very much interested in it um, because as I said, I think there is lots of promise here in terms of including bringing this into uh, the classrooms and perhaps uh, um, contributing to uh, supporting the curriculum that uh, ministries of education are trying to uh, uh, promote. Uh, that leads me to uh, the um, next question. Um, in the face of the crisis of COVID-19, uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic, what do you think might be some new directions for research and practice in mathematics curriculum and education in, in, in contexts where like these ones where schools are shut down and everything needs to be done remotely? Well, I think that there are things that we've become accustomed to through these last two years that um, we sort of, you know, we're forced to become accustomed to them and then people have gotten used to them. So, um, uh, you know, if, if remote communities have reasonable um, internet access, which I think is a priority right now, you can have many more people participating in things uh, remotely, you know, through Zoom or other technologies of that sort. Um, so it's a way of, of uh, you know, where people are not so isolated if they're in a remote place. Um, and, and it can also get us outdoors a little bit more and to slow down the pace of sort of driving in cars and rushing from one place to another, but to actually notice the places we are and to uh, look up close at the details of our, of our lives. So at the very beginning of, of uh, the pandemic, there was a group of us at UBC, uh, grad students and faculty members, who um, we put together a little blog called Math Inside and Out. And it was, um, it was meant to be a support for parents who had to have their kids suddenly at home. And knowing that for a lot of people, the first solution for sort of how to teach math to your, to your child would be um, grab some worksheets, get some notebooks that are a bunch of worksheets stapled together and just settle them down and tell them, just be quiet and do more worksheets. And if you finish the five, do another five, you know? Well, okay, yeah, I, you know, I guess there's something to be said for practicing an algorithm, okay, for a little while, when you feel motivated to do that. But that it's not the very most exciting thing you could take on. So we started to put together, and I would say this is sort of, uh, it was kind of a work in progress that we're not really adding to right now, but there's a few things there um, about ways of um, working, you know, in your backyard or your balcony or in the park nearby, 
or go down to the river or go to the um, you know to the little lake you know in in the park whatever whatever is available to you and start giving attention to um, living things and the the patterns that you see there and then start following up on them and uh, so of course fractals come into it different kinds of sequences everybody thinks everything is Fibonacci sequence and it's not quite a few things are but not everything <laughs> And also making making things often of natural materials that you could forage or find outdoors, and um, as well as with typically like paper and pencils and so on. So we started to try to to brainstorm, and then uh, after about um, a month and a half here in BC, the schools were back in session and, and never went back out again. So we were um, we sort of felt that they you know, the very strong necessity of doing that here in British Columbia wasn't as, you know, wasn't as, as intense anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think that those kinds of ideas, I mean, something as simple as um, cutting pieces of fruit in half um, um, widthwise rather than lengthwise and look at the pattern that's inside an apple or a banana or a zucchini or uh, a gourd and start to compare those patterns, try drawing those patterns. Um, you can be learning about how plants grow and reproduce and also about um, things like fiveness. You know, what makes something grow in a five? Sort of like, I can't, can't do it very easily here, but where, where you sort of make like a starfish with your body or the Vitruvian man. Well, what is this about five? We have five fingers, our sort of two limbs and our, our two arms, two legs and head make a kind of a five. Oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> An apple, uh, every apple has five little seed pods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, there's, it's in language too. I mean, I, I studied uh, Mandarin and the, um, the Mandarin word for, um, uh, for a, a delicious apple, like a red delicious apple is, let's see if I pronounce this correctly, but something like a wu dian ping guo, a five bump apple. <laughs> and if you look at the bottom of a, one of those apples, you'll see five very distinct bumps. And then look at an apple blossom. How many petals does it have? And why is that, right? So there's, there's this thing about fiveness that comes up and you can think about the number five in even the five on a dice where there's one central dot and four around is interesting. So you can start to play around with what five means and why things in the world grow in fives as well. Yeah, would you see this connected to uh, the concept of, um, or the expectation to, or the uh, skill of sabotaging where we group uh, quantities into, uh, into um, formulations and expect uh, students to, you know, David did a lot of work with that, where he noticed that kids would, um, they were asked to count items, right? Discrete items, and they would say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, without, and then he said, he noticed that there, there, there would be some kids who would just uh, count the groups of five as, as one, two, I have five fives here. So, so I wonder how this transition from exploration of, pat, of the pattern of patterns and the fives is a beautiful example of that. Uh, the transition from noticing to to using language so I, I pull out my handy dodecahedron which of course everybody must have one on their desk right absolutely so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is a, a a figure this was um one that plato actually took as a model of what the shape of the universe was a dodecahedron mm -hmm. and there's a wonderful canadian novel called the dodecahedron and can I remember the name of the author? Um, no, but it's a, it's a, so dodecahedron, dodeca means two and 10, yeah. 12. And the dodecahedron has 12 faces. And each one is in the shape of a pentagon five-sided figure. And how can I tell, how can I count it really fast? Well, since I have five fingers on each hand, I can put five fingers here and five fingers there. And I'm touching all but the two ends, right? There's one underneath there and there's one underneath there that I'm not touching. So it's five, five, and two. So it's 12 sides. And um, I have another object here. I don't know where it went. Let me just, sorry, I have to just check behind my computer. Oh. No, maybe it fell on the floor. I don't know where it went. Anyway, I had another object that's also a dodecahedron, but made of 12 little colored um, 
rubber balls that are stuck together. So there's an interesting way that you can, oh, here it is, I found it. So here's another, I think, I don't know if this is a dog toy or what this thing is, but I'm always looking for interesting dodecahedron and things. So if you look at one face, you can see five, like five petals with the one in the middle. And then if I put my five fingers on those, I can turn it the other way. And there's five petals with one in the middle. And I can start looking at the colors and say, okay, the yellows, there's three yellows by touching them. There's three greens. And what, you know, there's three reds and three blues. So there's four colors, three of each one. And they're just balls stuck onto another slightly larger ball in the center. I mean, somebody made thousands of these as and sold them in pet stores or toy stores or something or dollar stores. But how fascinating this is and how you can start to see the different planes that are defined by the, say, the three red balls or the three blue balls, you know, that, and, um, and a lot of it has to do with fiveness. And then there are only five of these platonic solids, as they're called, possible. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting too. Why are there five? Yeah. Um, anyway, there, there's all kinds. Anyway, all kinds of really interesting historical uh, explorations you can do with this as well. Absolutely. In, in addition to planes, uh, uh, people can explore um, other mathematical concepts. Uh, uh, I, as you were showing this, I was thinking about the coloring um, theory, where no two colors. No, I mean, looking at that, mm -hmm. uh, the rule to follow is that no adjacent. Uh, balls would be of the same color. So, so that's 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 another mathematical question uh, parents can ask their kids, you know, or not ask really, but explore together. Because yeah. I, I did not think about it before. I mean, this this is the first first time I, I'm I'm seeing this object, and but but it made me wonder about the coloring mm -hmm. and the pattern of patterns. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So we've got four colors here and three balls of each color. Could we do three colors and four balls of each one? Would that work or would we end up with contiguous balls being the same color? Because you and I are familiar with it. It's the four color theorem, not the three color theorem for map coloring. Yeah. But this is not a plain map. This is a three dimensional, very, you know, regular kind of object. So could we do it with three? You can see that there are sort of threes, like there's little triangle, triangular things happening here. Yeah. So I think I'd need three for sure, but I don't know if three would suffice or if I would if I would need to have four. So I, I should like to play with that one. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. You have another activity. That's beautiful. Yeah, but I, I think having or I'll show you one other really fun mathematical object here, and this is designed by a professor at um, at Stanford. I've just forgotten his name, but it's called a lollycopter, and you can buy it online. It's like a lollipop helicopter. So let me see if I can do this. Wow. So in it, it comes out to look something like a pine cone. Yeah. And it's based on um, the golden ratio and Fibonacci sequence as applied to a um, circular geometry. So each of these are, is the way that plants grow as well, that the leaves grow so that they won't shade any leaf below them directly. Mm -hmm. And Vi Hart has a, some lovely videos about this under her, her three Fibonacci videos, but so and then I can get them to line back up like a lolly, lollipop again. But it's, I mean, this has been made to, to, it's got little stops for each of these so that when you spin it, they stop at the right spot. But it's a lovely model for the way leaves grow on a plant and starts, and then again, it's colored. So you can sort of see these kind of somewhat spiraling mm -hmm. uh, blue, green, purple, turquoise. That's a beautiful example of the of what you talked about the inter interdisciplinary or perhaps we should um, use transdisciplinary or or cross disciplinary understanding mm -hmm. of mathematical ideas in different uh, contexts. Mm. That's so I find that sometimes these, these kind of objects are can be very fascinating and a lot of inquiries can come out of them. And there's lots that's known about them. But if, if I just told you okay, this is a dodecahedron, there are, you know, like, like, I'm just, just tell you stuff, like, well, then what's the point of that, right? It's yeah, not, and it's not very, um, and students, many, I, I, I would assume if I were a student now, uh, teach, and the teacher saying, this is the name of this shape, I would say to myself, who cares? Like, why do I need to know that? And, and uh, students do ask this question, why do we need to know that? Why do we need to do it? But, 
I hope that uh, with this conversation, um, uh, we will allow uh, different ways. I mean, it's not that it's not been allowed, uh, but uh, really surface this new ways of uh, thinking about um, math and em embodied mathematics with, with uh, arts and uh, movement and, and, and the use of, of uh, the environment. I have another math story here for you. <laughs> this was made by a friend who's a musician, fellow musician and traditional dancer. And it's a, a kind of process called wheat weaving. Um, so it's done, um, it's part of a kind of, of um, agricultural practices in the Welsh borders area of England. And um, so you, at the end of the season, you have the best wheat of the best seeds that are usually in the center of the field and you save them and you create something that's called a corn dolly or a wheat dolly. And this is part of the, and this is a tradition that's in many places that grow wheat, including places like Ukraine and Poland um, and, you know, lots of wheat growing areas. But um, this beautiful spiral is created just by bending and weaving these wheat stems. And it's really gorgeous. And you can see it's a, a kind of a descending spiral. And it'd be really interesting to think about what the ratios are between the different layers and how you actually make them by turning your hands. Uh, and then it has a, a traditional use that at the beginning of the new season, you take this really good grain and this is what you start to plant. It's a kind of seed saving. You plant the fields with it or you burn it and you save the seeds uh, to fertilize the fields. So, um, so that in many, many traditional practices, in many objects that we find around, like in nature and human culture, there are these amazing patternings that can go very deep. And um, as, as a teacher or an educator, if you can find some of them, you don't have to find all of them, but you can get people started and have some sense of how this might connect with math mathematical ways of thinking or mathematical knowledge that is in the curriculum. And then as new provocations come up, ask those questions and uh, explore. And you know, and, and we can help pe guide people to do things like think about variance in variance or think about, you know, um, you know, like think about the four color theorem and say, how would that apply here? And just kind of bring the culture and lore of mathematics into the story and then see what we find. And you end up with people who are good mathematical thinkers because they've had lots of chance to try it out. Absolutely. Lots of uh, mathematicians have been going through these very experiences when they grew mathematically. So uh, uh, lots, lots uh, of that there too. Uh, Professor Jarofsky, thank you very much for uh, this uh, very intriguing and insightful um, uh, conversation. I've, I, I learned a lot myself um, and I hope that uh, we will um, have more opportunities to collaborate uh, in the future. Thank you so much. All right, you too, Azna. Thanks so much. There you go. <laughs>